Hello and welcome to this video on radiation poisoning. This is also called acute radiation syndrome and radiation sickness. While there are a few names, it all covers a collection of health effects rather than a single illness. It is however caused by a single thing, high doses of ionizing radiation in a relatively short order. Ionizing radiation is distinct from other forms of radiation. For example, you have radio waves, microwaves, and infrared light. These are all non-ionizing. Conversely, you have X-rays, which are a category of electromagnetic waves, but are ionizing. The difference, to a certain extent, is how much penetrating force they have, but then what power they have once they've penetrated. Ionizing radiation has the ability to go through things, but it doesn't have very much depth to that penetration. Alpha rays are the uh, most powerful of ionizers, but they have the lowest penetration. X-rays, conversely, are a less powerful ionizer, but they have higher penetration. This is why you can have X-rays done of your chest, for instance, and get a complete image. But you may not find that radiation will penetrate through to the inner part of your chest cavity if it's alpha rays. The range and type of radiation can have a very important effect on just what kind of illnesses are exhibited from radiation poisoning. No matter what it is, it is going to take a relatively large dose. Typically, radiation poisoning begins at about 0.1 gray, or roughly 70 rads, in an hour or thereabouts. Alpha and beta radiation tend to be a little bit higher in the amount required, but they also have much more effect where they hit. This means that if, for example, it's an outside source, like a nuclear reactor, you need more than if it's inside your body. For example, if you've consumed radioactively poisoned water. The first and most obvious signs are going to be things like burns, and these will occur both inside and outside your body. Unlike what might be exhibited in games like Fallout, not all radiation or radioactive contamination is going to cause this. The alpha and beta type we've mentioned behave differently. For example, the alpha and beta radiation will only do this if there is fallout that is deposited on the individual. Gamma and neutron radiation will go straight through the body, and therefore they will cause some of this harm throughout the body. The differences in how it penetrates, how far it penetrates, and the power are some of the big reasons why this is so difficult to describe and understand. For example, the big concern, especially for any kind of environmental fallout, is that things like water and food will be affected by the radiation, and in turn become radioactive, leading to radiation poisoning. This is because they are both consumed. This leads to internal exposure. Internal exposure is much closer to major and very important organs. It can also lead to issues to do with it being absorbed into the bloodstream, circulated around the body. And in extremely bad situations, the material itself could be insoluble. And this means that the material will not break down in the body, only through radioactive decay. This means there will effectively be a forever source of radiation poisoning in the person unless removed surgically. This is why internal exposure, to a certain extent, is much more dangerous than external exposure. External exposure is comparably much easier to figure out and deal with. You fundamentally remove either the person from the source, or you remove the source from the person or peoples. Most of the time, this is easier done than trying to take something out of a person, because you have to find it in the person. There's also the fact that you have a rough idea of how much radiation is being emitted at any given time, and therefore, roughly, how much one person might have been exposed to. The further benefit to this is that, as we mentioned, many of the different kinds of radiation have differing levels of penetration. This means that it may be a relatively superficial level of exposure, where you could 
get some rather nasty burns, but it does mean that, at least in theory, you don't have any of the inner parts of the body damaged. You can also, fortunately, wash most of the contaminated surfaces and the skin to remove most of the radioactive material. This leads to the three main types of radiation poisoning. The three types tend to reflect not only where the effect is seen, but what is being affected. The first is hematopoietic. These are your blood cells, whether that is red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and so on. All of these are essential for the function of your body. One of the reasons why these are affected is that the blood cells need to divide relatively quickly, both to produce new erythrocytes or red blood cells, but also in order to make white blood cells and platelets. When the body notices that the cells are not dividing correctly, it begins to clear them out and destroy them. This can lead to obvious things like anemia, because you don't have red blood cells being made to replace those that have either been damaged or lost. Increased risk of infection due to a lack of white blood cells, and blood clotting issues from a lack of platelets. The whole body dose required for this is about 0.25 grays or 25 reds. This is well below the level where somebody would notice what's happening as far as the actual exposure is concerned. The next are gastrointestinal. This, again, tends to be a result of cell division problems. The gastrointestinal tract needs to constantly replace lost and damaged cells. This is because what goes through your GI tract tends to be rather abrasive. Consider what it looks like when it comes out the other end after having a high fiber diet. That has had to work its way through a very narrow tube being constantly crushed and moved along. That obviously means that part of the body needs to be repaired and replaced all the time. If you have internal exposure, for example, from food or water that has been poisoned, you are going to get a dose of radiation in that area. The absorbed doses anywhere between 60 to 30 grays or 600 to 3000 rads is enough to begin this happening. The damage to the body has obvious effects on how you're going to react to it. The obvious one will be abdominal pain, but loss of appetite and vomiting also exist along with nausea. Anything above 4 grays or about 400 rads is likely to be fatal, and this is unless you get some very serious treatment going. Most of the time this is down to damage to the gastrointestinal tract itself, not necessarily whole system damage to the entire body. Finally you have neurovascular. Neurovascular is fundamentally any of the arteries and veins involved in your brain. These will begin to show damage somewhere around 30 grays or above, these being 3000 rads or more. Lower doses, as little as 10 grays or 1000 rads, can also cause this, although there tend to be other complicating factors present. The results of exposure at this level tend to be dizziness, headaches, and loss of consciousness. If this is not treated immediately, then you're likely to see these symptoms occurring very, very soon after exposure. And unfortunately, unlike the last two systems, this does not really have any treatment available. Treatment itself may give the opportunity for something more interesting or exciting, but nothing is likely to work and the person will genuinely die. Symptoms of radiation poisoning include nausea and vomiting, as mentioned, diarrhea, headache, fever, dizziness, weakness, hair loss, vomit, infections, and low blood pressure. This is a combination of the three different possible major parts of the body that are affected. We spoke about how much radiation is needed for particular systems, that being the hemopoietic, which is your bone marrow fundamentally, the gastrointestinal, which is your intestines and stomach, and the neurovascular, which is your brain and the arteries and veins associated with it. Not all doses need to be specific to have the kind of effects that we're talking about. One of the challenges is, if you don't have an internal exposure, but an outside exposure, 
how do you figure out how much somebody has had given to them as a dose? This is why different measures are used. There's something called the whole body absorbed dose. There's also equivalent dose, effective dose, and committed dose. These are used in different circumstances. Some are used for long-term exposure, for example, cancer risks. Others are there to figure out what the general exposure is under normal circumstances. Others are environmental. So if, for example, you live in an area that has had problems with nuclear problems in the past, you might have whole body exposures or whole body absorption doses. For the most part, they're not used with regards to poisoning so often because poisoning is generally viewed as an acute matter, not a longer term environmental matter. And so it's nearly always a case that greys are used in the case of acute radiation sickness, poisoning or similar words. When looking at those environmental situations, something like civets or millisivets, and in some cases REM, are used instead. This is as mentioned because, for the most part, radiation poisoning occurs external to the body, and most of that is generally gamma radiation. Because gamma radiation is able to go through the entire body, and therefore able to affect most every part of it, there's no need to differentiate between what's affecting the inside, the outside, and what's affecting which part of the body. Chances are good that if you're exposed to gamma radiation, the whole of you is exposed to gamma radiation, as the Hulk would know. Something the Hulk, and for that matter, most mutants have in common with gamma radiation is how it does its damage. The primary means of damage is by affecting DNA. Ionizing radiation has the rather nasty ability to be able to alter the connections that are linking different parts of the DNA strand. Quite often this is by affecting the deoxyribose backbone of DNA. This then means that the nucleotides that make up the sequence don't line up correctly. Further effects can be that it modifies the way chromatin, which holds the DNA together, can do so. There are also issues where it can alter the charge of particular nucleotides, causing them to link to their neighbours rather than their counterpart on the other side of the helix. Ionizing radiation can also have effects by creating radical oxygen species within cells. This within the cell causes them to begin to break down very quickly, as that radical oxygen species creates unwanted and unneeded reactions within the cell itself. Normally cells can deal with all of this when it's one or two isolated incidents. The problem with radiation poisoning is that it's not one or two cells independently going rogue, it's many cells going rogue at the same time. This means that the damage is extended over a large area. As a whole organism, that's a problem. The way it gets worse is that within the cells themselves, where there are normally checks and balances to ensure that if something like DNA replication or modification is incorrect, it can be fixed, it can't when we're talking about ionizing radiation. That's because the ionizing radiation affects larger sequences of DNA at one time. This means that where one or two mistakes in isolation could be resolved, Everything breaks across a wide area, and the cell can't fix that. This means those cells then undergo self-destruction or apoptosis. The longer the exposure goes on, the more damage occurs, and so the more you get to see the effects of radiation poisoning or sickness. These are symptoms we've already described. As a rule, there isn't a lot of treatment available especially once the radiation sickness gets to an advanced level. You simply can't keep someone alive at that point, and there are ethical questions about whether or not it's humane or not to keep someone alive if they are that badly put off by radiation sickness. If they don't get to that point, then there are measures that can be put in place. The most common of these are going to be not so much to treat the radiation sickness itself. It's more aimed at supplementing the body's ability to 
do what needs to be done without the source of them. So it would be antibiotics to make up for the lack of white blood cells. It would be blood products to make up for the fact there's a lack of blood proteins and other plasma products. Then possibly erythrocytes or red blood cells. There's use of colony stimulating factors to try and get the bone marrow producing those cells that are needed desperately. And hopefully having an effect on other cells again to support their growth and repair of the body. If all of this is failing, or, as is the case in some instances, the bone marrow and other stem cells have been completely wiped out by the radiation, you may be looking at a stem cell transplant. A bone marrow transplant in some cases may be enough, in other instances something more comprehensive may be required. This will replace the entirety of the cell lines needed to produce the necessary cells for the body. This is a much longer process, and this is obviously why it's a last line or a last resort. Radiation poisoning is a case of dose making the poison, but also what kind of poison is very relevant. Where radiation comes from and what part of the body it affects will have huge ramifications as to what you see and experience. It is only when all of the factors are balanced do you see the results that are either good or bad. This is why they can range from relatively mild to mortal. A very focused, very refined beam of ionizing radiation can help to destroy cancer cells. Indiscriminate shining of radiation on every part of the body can lead to death. It's how it's used, where it's applied, and at what dose. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions that you have below.